bunker fuels, the fuels that power vessels that carry cargoes around the world and an area of our business which is changing rapidly at the moment. Hi, I'm Richard Watts, founder of HR Maritime. Welcome back to Commodity Brief. In this episode, we're going to be looking at bunker fuels. So we're carrying on looking at the different commodities and how they work in our industry. Now, bunker fuels, bunker fuels is an area which is changing very, very rapidly at the moment. These are the fuel that we use to power the vessels that carry commodities around the world. In order to understand bunker fuels correctly, we have to look a little bit back in history. So if we go back in time a little bit, we had for many, many years, vessels were being powered by wind. And so you had these sailing ships which were carrying cargoes around the world. And up until about the 1800s, this was the only form of propulsion for these vessels. Now, they were very, very beautiful, but they weren't very reliable in terms of the timing, with the speed, and they could get stuck without wind for long periods of time. So in about the 1800s, we started seeing coal being used in steamships. This is the time of the Industrial Revolution, when we were seeing coal being used for many, many different applications. And so as it was being used on steamships, this allowed vessels to travel much, much faster. It allowed them to have reliable timetables so that we could actually plan out the route. We knew when we were going to be arriving. And also in combination with using steel for the construction of the vessels, we ended up with much larger vessels. And so this was very, very, very quickly changing the world of commodities and how they were transported around the world. Now, the thing is that coal had a couple of disadvantages. First of all, in terms of filling, refueling or coaling the vessel, it used to take a long time. It took a lot of labor. Basically, for ships, it used to take all of the crew. They had to all get involved with this. And also, when the coal was on board of the ship, when it was being stored, it would have to be moved around the ship when it was needed in the engine because it was not liquid, it couldn't be pumped, and so this was an issue. In about the 1920s, we ended up seeing a lot more of the oil coming in. As oil was coming in, this was taking advantages of a lot of the ports which had been established through coal use. And so different ports have been established around the world. Now, this particular map shows BP's locations for a certain type of fuel today, but it illustrates where those particular ports were. First of all, we had Gibraltar here, we had Durban down here, and we had Singapore here. And these were the areas where there were supplies of coal and vessels that would stop on a regular basis to fill up. So as we're moving into the use of oil, and a lot of this was pushed by military needs, by the Navy, particularly during the, at the end of the First World War and coming into the Second World War, this was a massive change that was happening. And so as oil was being used, this, it has two times the calorific content, so the power generation capacity of coal. It was able to be pumped, so loading and discharging was much quicker. You could store it anywhere you wanted within the vessel, and it produced a lot less smoke. And so for military purposes, then your vessel was a lot less visible. So now we find ourselves in a situation where we use a number of different types of liquid fuel for our vessels. For about a hundred years, we've been using two main types. So we use fuel oil, so heavy fuel oil, and we use marine gas oil. Heavy fuel oil, this is really sticky, hard substance, which is very much the bottom of the refining process. This is used for the main engines of the vessels. We also have marine gas oil, and so this is essentially the same as diesel. This is used for the auxiliary engines, and also used for tight maneuvering within ports. And so this is an area which is moving very, very rapidly at the moment. We had in 2020, 1st of January, the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, came in with new regulations limiting the sulfur content of fuel oil. And this created a big, big impact on the world of shipping and the supply of these goods and this bunkers around the world. Basically, vessels went a number of different paths. They either decided to carry on using high sulfur fuel oil but install scrubbers, or they started using low sulfur fuel oil, or they started using gas oil. And so we ended up with different supplies with differences in the prices between these supplies themselves. Now we're moving on to a number of different supplies, which we'll get into a second. 
In terms of the trading of bunker fuel, there are a number of different companies which are very, very active. Now, it is often in turmoil. And so if we went back a number of years, we had OW Bunkers, who were the largest supplier in the world. And then they came into financial difficulties. They went bankrupt. When they went bankrupt, they had about 7% of the global market. The biggest player had 7%. So you can see it's quite a fragmented market. Then the largest player in the market was the company Aegean. Again, they ended up having financial difficulties and were actually being bought up by Minerva, who were bought up by Mercuria. And so we see a bit of consolidation within the world of bunker trading. Now here we have a table of the largest 10 bunker trading companies in the world. And so bunker holding is the largest. But we, these companies, they all have physical bunker trading. So basically they buy large quantities of fuel oil, gas oil, and then they transport it around the world to where it is required. Now in terms of bunker trading itself, unfortunately we do have some risks. The risk is basically pollution. And this is a good example of a dry cargo vessel which ran aground in Mauritius earlier this year, earlier in 2020. And this came in, the, came in the news an awful lot because the first initial reports were a tanker, an oil tanker has run aground and there is an oil slick. This is not an oil tanker. This is a dry cargo vessel, and the problem is that the vessel has fuel tanks with a capacity of almost 4,000 tonnes of fuel oil. And so when this type of vessel does end up running around or there is an accident, then it can create a huge amount of pollution. So we have to be very, very careful about this when we're handling bunkers and any kind of transshipment that we're seeing. So. Bunkering, the bunkering market is changing very quickly. The fuel that we are using is changing very, very quickly. I have a separate episode which is looking at decarbonization and the efforts which are being made to reduce emissions in shipping and trading. And so we see a number of different types of fuels which are being used at the moment. LNG is very popular. And so we have um, Singapore looking to try and bunker 1 million tons of LNG by the end of this year, by the end of 2020. Um, we see a number of LNG bunker barges which are being commissioned around the world. We also see efforts to try and use ammonia as a fuel. We see methanol as a fuel, and we even, even see hydrogen being used as a fuel. And so this is an area which is changing very, very rapidly. But we're also seeing other types of propulsion. And so here is an example of a vessel which will start using wind power. And this is actually becoming very, very popular. It's something that was really a bit of a almost an unusual idea a couple of years ago and now it's actually taking taking um, part in the industry and people are starting to think this could actually have a future. Another example is using kites and so the company Air Seas they have a kite that installs onto the front of the vessel and then pulls the vessel and reduces the fuel consumption. Basically anything that can reduce the fuel consumption is seen as positive because the costs are massive and when you're looking at the bunker costs of a typical voyage you might be looking at anything from 40 up to 60% of the journey time. And when you think that the large container vessels today are using up to 150 metric tons of fuel per day, this is an area where we have to try and start using less. So that brings us to the end of this episode looking at bunker fuels. We hope you've enjoyed it and you'll click back for future episodes looking at different commodities. Thank you. Mm -hmm.